Hi everyone, I'm Jeremy Cordo. Welcome to what I think is the only homemade, handmade television show from the garage and from the heart. Now if it's in the news, on your mind, close to your heart, getting under your skin, on your chest, it's in the court of public opinion. Homemade, handmade television from the garage and from the heart. Uh, my special guest first up in the program is Professor Ian Richards. Now, Ian Richards is a most illustrious journalism. He is the professor of journalism at uh, the University of South Australia. And I've invited him on the program to talk about these gotcha uh, crank calls, uh, joke calls, call them what you like. But they are and have been a part of the radio industry for a long time, and uh, thank God, not often has something gone wrong. But, you know, the truth is, words can kill. And people have to be well-trained and they have to be responsible for what they say and do. Management, of course, up to the chairman of whichever company it is, ends up with the buck stopping on his or her desk. And that's only fair. The problem I have with the FM use of the freedom, creative freedom of radio, and particularly with the telephone, is that these people are not experienced. They're not journalists, they've had no training, they haven't been to the country. It seems that the more adventurous you are, uh, the more you will be appreciated by management. Management should be terrified of inexperience and lack of judgment, because they are ultimately going to handle what flows from that, which can be, as you've seen this week, horrific. You'll meet the professor in just a moment. Most illustrious academic, and, and I guess you could say, I won't blame him, but, you know, re responsible for those people who want to learn the industry in the best possible way, the people who study journalism, or they study the media, he is the person who is training the people you will get to be very familiar with in the coming years. Now, the other thing I want to mention here in what we lovingly call my monologue, it's my chance to sound off about stuff. And I really like that because if, <laughs> if I didn't have that opportunity, I would be back uh, where I was last year, uh, walking up and down the veranda with my glass of red, uh, lecturing and uh, uh, hectoring the possums. And uh, you wouldn't want to have me do that. You, if, you, if you're an animal lover, you wouldn't want that. They come up onto the veranda and they sit there with their children and they're absolutely amazed. Anyway, the other thing I wanted to mention to you, uh, there's a new national charities regulator aimed at cutting red tape and straightening up the charitable industry, the not-for-profits. Okay, so we've got this big inquiry and heaven knows what we're going to have. Is it going to be like Fuel Watch and uh, petrol, petrol Watch and Grocery Watch? Uh, and now we've got a, 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 another form of electricity watch. I mean, is, that, is it going to end up like that? Just hiring commissioners and, and, uh, and uh, uh, directors or whoever they are, more bureaucrats. Bureaucrats don't fix anything. I suppose they could if they had teeth. Well, then they wouldn't, we wouldn't need regulators, we'd need alligators, because they're about the only creature that's got the teeth that would be needed. If you're going to look at charities, just look at the simple thing of where does the money go. Every charity should have to state how much of every dollar goes to the cause for which it was donated. Do you know that legally a charity can set itself up, call itself a charity, and up to 60% of every dollar could go to administration? Now that's not acceptable in my book. That's crazy. Uh, when I was involved with the Variety Club, seven cents in the dollar went to uh, administration. Now, we don't want charities leasing motor cars, having credit cards, going on overseas trips. No, just state how much of the charitable dollar that you give to us will go to our cause. I think that is the clarity. I'm not sure what the red tape is all about. I'm not sure, but make it clear. So we don't have executives, uh, CEOs, running charities earning $400,000 a year, and yes, they do, but you'll never know. Anyway, that's what I have to think on that, but uh, we'll see in Rundle Mall in a very short time what you have to say about a whole bunch of different things that are hot topics this week. 
This is the Court of Public Opinion. With this hot weather, when I was doing the radio show every morning, I obviously knew what the day was going to be. My um, faith in forecasting does extend to one day in advance. However, when it comes to climate change, they are prepared to make a punt on what's going to happen 100 years from now. Uh, that is either courageous or very stupid. But I, 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 I don't mean to go on about that now. But uh, I used to say, when the temperature was up there, about 35 or whatever, put some water out for the birds. And I did it on all of those occasions. This is the only venue that I have to make a kind of wide-ranging uh, request that you do that. So on a, a fairly hot day, do remember to put some water out for the birds. They would have really ap appreciated. Now, <laughs> I find myself in a dilemma here because uh, my first guest, Professor Ian Richards, has the most amazing, illustrious CV that you could possibly imagine. If I sat here and worked my way through this, there would be no time for the interview, uh, which is both a tribute and a fairly accurate observation. Professor Ian Richards, Professor of Journalism, South Australian Uni. Welcome. Well, thank you, Jeremy. I wanted to talk to you about uh, this uh, prank, crank, phone yes. call business. It's been pointed out to me that that sort of genre has been around for a long, long time without terribly many adverse um, results. I mean, do you see all this stuff as an overreaction? Well, it, it's an interesting question because the... Look, a couple of things, Jeremy. The, the first thing is, that I guess in this case, the people who were involved in it weren't journalists. I mean, that's in the popular mind, they're seen no. as journalists, but they're not, they're not um, qualified or trained journalists. Um, but the ju basic principle was right. It goes right back to candid, the days of Candid Camera and those sort of programs many, many years yes, ago. Yeah. It's gone through on television and radio. Um, there's an audience for it, so uh, yeah. it's, 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 it's survived, yeah. And it was pointed out to me that Orson Welles, back in whatever the year was, uh, wasn't, I, don't, I think was it was earlier it was, than the 40s. Yeah, it, was, it was 38, I think, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, War of the Worlds yeah. broadcast as a play brilliantly done, convincingly done, panic all over America because they believed it. They thought it was a, a news broadcast. I mean, when you sort of say, oh, we, we are breaking into this yeah. program with an urgent <laughs> newscast, yes. and you'd prick up your ears and you'd sort of forget the context in which all of this began and you'd believe it. Well, now, that was a crank thing. Well, up to a point it was, although I guess they had no idea what was... They hadn't been done before, so they didn't really understand the implications and what the effect it would have. But his excuse for the chaos that ensued was, uh, I, of course I thought, the Mercury Theatre, we do this every week and this is a play. Yeah, well, I think, I, I, I think things have changed a lot since then um, because there have been so many pranks. I think, I mean, every April Fool's Day we get, get a prank from... Um, a lot of the media will have special pranks and yeah. things that they, they perform. Is that acceptable? Um, the, look, the, I think a lot of it comes back to what what's involved in it. If it. Some of them are harmless and some of them aren't harmless. Mm. And I think in this case, um, I think we know which category it falls into. <laughs> yes. Uh, the unintended consequence. Yeah, precisely. I, yeah. I, I firmly believe those kids, yeah. inexperienced, of course, yeah. as they are, I'm, I'm convinced they meant no harm and they couldn't foresee what yeah. was going to happen. Yeah. But I, I remember when Oliver Stone came out with his movie, uh, Talk Radio, uh, I, I've got the poster somewhere, it's a great poster. Um, there's the name of the movie, Talk Radio, and the, the punchline is Words Can Kill. And of course they have. Yeah, it's a very good point, it's a very good point. Um, I guess in this situation, the, the, there's a couple of points I'd make. I think, I think one is that, I, don't, I think it's wrong to just dump everything on these, these two relatively inexperienced um, broadcasters. Mm. Um, because they're not, they're not um, necessarily trained to deal with it. And also, as I think some of the experts in psychology and psychiatry have said since then, that um, people get... Uh, can, uh, suicide can be triggered by all sorts of things and there are a whole lot of, usually a whole lot of factors involved, not just one ep incident. So, yeah. um, so in this case, it means that there are... Um, well, I think a lot of it comes back to station management, actually, to be honest with you. I think that the, responsi the ultimate responsibility is, is the more senior people who run the station. I don't think they're any more experienced than those two... Uh, who, who, who did the show. <laughs> no, that's probably true. I, I don't know them personally, but uh, um, the issue, I think, is that whether they're experienced or not, it's ignorance yes. is no defence. So, Well, when I was on the air, it, it was uh, not, you know, alarmingly frequently, 
because you hate to think that your audience is suicidal and that you may have played some part yeah. in that, but you would get the odd suicide call. And I, I remember one woman yeah. who rang had taken the tablets. Now, I'm not a trained psychiatrist or no, psychologist. Of course, of course. So you do this kind of uh, bush uh, psychologist attempt at, uh, on one hand, turning a call like that into entertainment, because uh, everything you do on radio yeah. has got to be entertaining yeah. or informing. Yes, of course, of course, yeah. Uh, there was one woman who had taken the pills and she had driven somewhere and she didn't know where she was. And uh, she was uh, in a phone box and uh, was basically calling for help. And we had people all over the city looking for her. Right. But that could have ended in tragedy. We may not have got there. We, a taxi driver was listening to the show and he happened to go past the area that she was trying to describe and saw her in the phone box. Got her out, called so, an ambulance. So that was a positive outcome. Happy yeah, ending. Yeah, but yeah. a lot of those suicide yeah. calls that Laws in Sydney and uh, other people, yeah. uh, they really brought it to, uh, too close to entertainment. Yeah. I, um, the difference, of course, is that the situation you're talking about is not a prank. You weren't involved, I assume. No, but the media has this um, role to play in understanding what is entertaining and what is plain, yeah. downright dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, and it was Laws who made that famous comment that I'm an entertainment, not a entertainer, not a journalist, I think. Um, yes. Yeah, some years ago. Um, well, I think it's a difference between people who call in the situation you're describing, where obviously you behaved appropriately and responsibly and all those sorts of things, mm. uh, and the situation where they, the um, media person or the media, the, whatever it is, the, the um, station actually precipitates that behaviour from, the, from yeah. an innocent party. But, but that brings me to the main point. My main grouch is that the uh, people on FM radio particularly... Now, when I got into radio, yeah. I never thought I'd be old enough to say in my day, but... <laughs> In those days, you couldn't get a job in a metropolitan station unless you'd had at least two, probably three years' experience in the country. These people on FM, prankster radio, and it's their genre. They, they, it's, yeah. it's all guffawing and... Uh, yeah. Well, now, they probably are stand-up comics or maybe they've been driving a cab and somebody said, look, I like you, come in and do a radio <laughs> show. Yeah. No experience. And I think the management is about the same level. Yeah, look, I, I, I mean, in this case, I can't comment on the individual backgrounds, but I should say that, did you get involved in pranks in your, your day? What, what happened? How did you handle oh, them then? Oh, Lordy, I don't think... Uh, my show was a, uh, a current affairs news talk yes. entertainment programme. Uh, and when we did do or did those call-out things, I remember we, yeah. we uh, got a... Um, uh, a note on uh, the teletype. It was that long ago. Yes, I understand. <laughs> and it said, uh, uh, hostage, hostages taken. Your younger viewers won't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but still. <laughs> oh my God, I know. <laughs> uh, hostages taken at the Brunei Brith building in Washington. And uh, our brilliant executive producer uh, came in and with their phone number. Yeah. And uh, he uh, said, why don't you ring them? So I did. Yeah. And uh, this rather gruff voice said, um, hello. And I said, oh, well, I'm Jeremy Cordeau from the Macquarie Broadcasting Network. I used to always say that because I didn't want to not get something because yeah. they thought, oh, just Adelaide. Yes. yes so the Macquarie it. Broadcasting Network, we understand there's a siege going on. Could you tell us what's happening? You need to talk to Abdul. Yeah. So 1970 five or six, what's changed? Uh, same people, same problem. Brunei Brith being a Jewish thing. Yes, I understand, yes. Thing. Anyway, he talked to me in this very eloquent and intelligent manner, Abdul. He had already killed three people. He had 30 hostages. He said he was going to kill one an hour until sure. certain things were delivered to him. And uh, in one part of the discussion, he says to a fellow, chilling stuff, he says to somebody, one of his uh, partners in crime, uh, OK, look, I, I don't think I'm going to wait for the hour. I'm on, a, uh, I'm on uh, Australian national uh, radio, <laughs> radio and so. uh, that'll be picked up by the world. This is a good opportunity. Bring her over, I'll cut ahead of yeah. And he'd already done it three times, so I yeah. knew he yeah, had yes, nothing course, to yeah. lose. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you see, I shouldn't have made that call because that could have ended 
terribly. He didn't kill her, but how was I to know? Mm. And would I put my hands up and say, gee, unexpected consequences? Mm. It is a very responsible thing to have a telephone and a broadcasting yeah. station at your yeah. disposal. Yeah, no, it is. There was a case, which I'm sure you're familiar with, Mike Willisey many years ago. Yes, I know. The yes. Kangrass swamp, yeah, where yeah. we're a similar situation yeah. with the hostage. Um, and the police, they were very annoyed that um, yep. a journalist came along and inter interrupted what they were trying to do. Um, so, no, look, I think you raise a, raise a most valid point, and a lot of it's driven by, I mean, the drive for ratings, that's essentially what it's all about. Yes, so, um, yes. Surviving, the, the audience, is, is people will tune in and listen to that. But there's a big question, a difference with pranks, I think, because um, a lot of people don't like them or feel uncomfortable about them. Yeah. Um, there's, I know there's a debate about the age group that likes them, that gen Generation Y, Gen yeah. Y are the ones who are into it now. And, um, but there's also another issue with the, um, because of, the, uh, of social media now, you get all sorts of comments made. And the, the, the response to the, cu the current case, the one in London that we're oh. talking about, or we began talking about, um, a lot of um, people, you know, what are called trolls, a, a lot of um, nasty inv invective and uh, vindictive stuff has come out towards the two broadcasters. Yes. Uh, which in a sense, is it's, they're being treated in the same way the nurse was treated, or, if, or worse. So, I mean, there's, there's even a risk that they may, they may be driven to suicide themselves. I mean, that's, and I understand um, some of the... Um, people with expertise in that area who said, look, lay off these guys or you know, we don't want another, another death on our hands. They're winding me up, but just quickly, you're the man responsible for training the next generation of journalists. Well, what, I, what is the advice you Well, have? I wouldn't say I have sole responsibility across the country, there are many of us who do it. <laughs> <laughs> but and I'm not responsible for all the faults of the media either. <laughs> no. Um, sorry, your question was that the... What is the advice you'd give that, those new... Oh, I think you've got to be... Uh, look, there's, 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 there's two strands, I think. I, I think to be a good journalist for, for eternity, it, through, looking back through the history and c contemporary times and even the times when you and I were young, um, curiosity was an essential thing. Journal to survive in journalism, you had to have an, an undying curiosity about the world and about people. So I think that's, the, that's always the same as it has always been. But the other thing, I th on top of that now, I think you just have to be so flexible and so, so able to do... You have to be multi-skilled, which is a cliche, I know, but you do have to be able to fit in a whole range of areas. But you have to be, have facility with the old, what are the older skills, established skills of how to report things and how to interview people and those things. But you also need, need to have the technical skills to run, to operate online, to operate uh, in, in a world which is mm. changing, converging, as we know. I mean, we all know yeah. there's a chaos in, in that area, in a, in a sense, now. And you have to be flexible and be able to fit in wherever you can. And I think they also need a, a strong moral compass. Yes, I think it's a very good point. Actually, I agree with that. I think it's an excellent point. Um, and in once upon a time, um, there was uh, the journalist code of ethics was essentially the media alliance code, which most people followed in, in when it was an almost 100% unionism, a unionised workforce. But that's not the case these days. No. So, and a lot of people come into the industry without training, without proper background, with, and so on. And um, and I do think that people who come through the journalism programs around the country have have actually had a, a, a have, a, have should have that moral compass that you're talking about. Professor, about wonderful. Sorry. Uh, sorry, my apologies. Yeah. But wonderful to see you. Happy. Have a very happy Christmas and thank you for sparing the time at what must be a very busy time of the year. Well, Appreciate look, it immensely. Oh, well, look, thank you, Jeremy. All the best to you and your viewers too. Professor Ian Richards. Great house. Thank you. Ross Dale built it for us. We love it. I'll show you through. We wanted a house with a barley feel, so we worked with our building consultant and designers to develop a plan we liked. They were so flexible and cooperative. When it was all designed, we got an absolute fixed price and they stuck to it. No extra charges and their people were fantastic to work with. We're actually thinking of building a new home. You should go and see all their displays and talk to them about your ideas. It's the best thing we've ever done. Rossdale Homes. Because trust is a must. Scammels, South Australia's specialist estate auctioneers. Visit us at 7 Chapel Street, Norwood or at www.scammelauctions.com.au The jury is up next and the questions we took to Rundle Moore. But first I want to say something about this... Uh, I don't know if you listen to uh, Asia Pacific on the ABC, but... I heard the other night this most extraordinary story. It was about the Malaysian Health Department's edict. They call it a fatwa, an edict. 
all girl children must be circumcised. This is from the government of Malaysia, with whom we seek to cozy up every chance we get. How the world can stand by and allow it to go on, I don't know. How the world can stand by and see a nation like Malaysia turn it into law must be done. Now the United Nations, you would imagine, would jump in and have something to say about this. But of course they're politically correct to the end. And I don't know that they have, uh, I'm trying to find another word than balls, but I don't think they have the courage to do anything about it. But whether Australia should uh, cease trading with them, seek to lecture them, someone should do something. It's just behaviour that internationally, morally, isn't acceptable. It's called, by the way, it's not female circumcision, it is female genital mutilation. And it's not acceptable in any part of the civilised world. In Malaysia, it's a fairly conservative country. How they sort of come up with that as a edict or a fatwa, uh, I have no idea. Now, the other thing I was going to uh, mention to you, if I can find it, as you will have probably observed, I'm not the uh, most organised person. <laughs> the problem is the paper. You know? <laughs> if I could just remember everything, it would be fine. Uh, a couple more anniversaries. Uh, Roger Whittaker's first festival theatre concert, 1984. This day, the first scene of Gone with the Wind was filmed back in 1938. Alfred Nobel died in 1896. The first Nobel Prizes were awarded in, awarded in uh, 1901. Uh, the first pneumatic tyre was patented by the Scottish civil engineer Robert Thompson. Uh, in South Australia, unskilled workers were awarded a living wage comparable to the Commonwealth basic wage of seven shillings a day. Seven shillings a day. The first England to Australia flight came into Darwin with Ross and Keith Smith, 1919, and lots of other interesting things. It was basically also the day back in 1990 that um, uh, young Warwick Fairfax sent a, a $2 billion company uh, bankrupt. I've, it's a very complicated story and we have no time for it here and probably nowhere else. Now, Coralie Cheney. Hi, Jeremy. On the jury, Caroline Peacock and Christine Esau. Hello, Jeremy. Hi. It's hot weather. It is hot weather. <laughs> it is, but then again it is that time it's of the Christmas. year. It's Christmas. Yeah. Look, before we get into the questions we asked, and they're all, I hope, pertinent and interesting, um, <laughs> there was this story from the Daily Mail overseas about a grand survey of grandmothers. And the survey of grandmothers said, lazy parenting of children causes rudeness. Mm -hmm. Lack of table manners adds to it all. And, you know, to a person, a grandparent or a grandmother, grandfather, they all say the same thing. It is the problem of uh, permissive parents. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about that? I, I agree. I mean, it's up to the parents to make them responsible to be able to sit down at a table, for example, have proper etiquette, learn manners, mm. have conversation around the table. And these days, with parents being busy, it's easier to put them in front of the television, in, you know, eating out of a paper bag or something like that. So, um, yeah, it's being a lost part of our culture mm. and it's very sad. And with that goes respect communication. I mean, how do they end up having great relationships with their partners if they can't even sit across the dinner table and hold a conversation? Yeah. Because they're not doing it at home as kids and they're not, learn you know, they're not learning to do it. No. So yeah, it is the resp responsibility of the parents. I'd take it further. I would say it goes back to the grandparents because the grandparents was that era where we can get out and we can do things. And then with the introduction of full-time television, they use that as a babysitter and people work longer, then you know, don't have the evening meal as such every mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. So that it's not just the, um, the parents' fault, it's the grandparents' fault who let them into this situation where children don't sit down at six o'clock and have dinner with both parents. Mm -hmm. That's a thing of the past. Mm. Also, you've got to remember, mostly there are no 
both parents around. Mm. In a lot of in cases, lot of that's cases true. That is but you can still have those rules and, and routines. Yes, and they have to and, be maintained. And they have to be maintained, and the parents need to do that because the grandparents obviously aren't, well, not necessarily bringing up the children. They are in some cases these days too. Mm. So, I mean... But it's also my pet hate that <coughs> now everybody's living longer and everyone talks about grandmothers. Well, what age is a grandmother? A man is a gentleman. But as soon as a woman reaches a certain age, she's a grandmother. <laughs> and she is the one who supposedly dictates all these things and rules and sits back as if she's a 96-year-old when she's probably in her late 40s yeah. and just exasperated because she's now looking after her children's children and mm. feels like she'd like a bit of life of her own. <laughs> I think it's educational as well as parenting. It's a, it's a combined effort because we're also sending children to school earlier. We're sending them to early childhood education. A lot of parents are sending their children to childcare before they can talk. So it's got to be a joint effort um, of both the education system, yeah. early education system, as well as parenting at home. Mm. And so you've got after school activities. There's mm. the other thing, it's not just the parents away at work. You've got to get the children to soccer practice at 7.30 at night or a netball game at 8 o'clock at night. And these are primary children. Mm. Mm. But if, if you have a, a system uh, that is slowly breaking down, it usually breaks down so slowly you don't even notice it happening mm. on a day to day basis. But the kids don't seem to have the respect for their mm. parents and the parents don't seem to demand. But it's also the schooling system. In the state schools, you call the teacher by their first name. Yeah, don't I know. Mr or Mrs or Sir. The world is changing, and it's not changing for the better. Uh, I prefer back in the days when men were men and movies really moved. <laughs> <laughs> and songs went bumper to bumper, dang, dang, dang. But I'll never get there. I mean, it's, it's all done. Now, let's go to the mall. Uh, first question we asked, should they ban the broadcasting of radio prank or crank calls? And this is what you think. No, because it's pretty funny and it's Australian, really. Um, it depends how far the prank goes. Yeah. Like, like yeah. If, if it gets out of hand, then no. But, like, if it's to a just a bit of degree, fun, yeah. I think it's OK. Um, um I, don't, I, I don't think so, but... I don't think so, but I think there should be more regulation as to what they do, like, you know, with recent events and things like that, so... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, I... Uh, no. I don't think so, provided it's done respectfully and that um, the, the right people know what's going on before it's uh, presented as something spontaneous. I mean, the Queen. The Queen and the Duke. I mean, you would have to be sent on. For that. I heard that interview on Channel 9 the other day with them, and um, I don't believe it all. I don't believe all of what they said. I believe they were sorry, but when they asked, <coughs> when they asked who, um, <coughs> who authorised it, um, I, I can't get my head around that one. I think I might have to listen to that again to really think about that one. But yeah, no, I, I wouldn't. If someone said to me, would, would I? I'd say no. Depends. I reckon yes. If the, if the person knows but like afterwards, so they get asked if they want to be broadcast, then that's fine. But if they don't ask them, then that's really not fair. Yeah, I just don't like prank calls altogether. Why's that? I just think they're silly and I just a waste of time. It's just so stupid. No, um, I don't think people should do it because it's annoying. But there's no reason to, to ban it. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's a tough one. I think it depends the, of the context of yeah, what, the, like of what's said what, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I personally believe, coming from that business, that in all honesty, uh, the people on FM radio particularly, they're not journalists, mm -hmm. they're usually stand-up comics or some form of entertainer, but no experience. From experience comes wisdom and judgment, mm -hmm. and I don't see it like that. This present scandal involving Oz Stereo, mm -hmm. what do you think? I mean, I don't think it's the announcer's fault. They're doing a job to increase ratings, to make interesting radio, which is their you know, gender. Management have to look at their rules and, and um, expectations of them and how it's done. But I think it goes down to the whole social media thing. You know, people are then being bombarded with comments and these comments then cause grief. And again, there's no respect. So mm -hmm. you, you know, it, it boils down, then down to these sad situations where this nurse has taken her life. And obviously there's more to that too, because maybe that was the straw that broke the camel's back or that she had other serious problems to, to do that. 
I remember when we were kids, Jeremy, we used to have this little old saying, you know, sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you. Yeah. And it was your way of, in the, in the playground, coping with taunts if, you know, people were saying things. And you'd just brush it off and then they'd go, oh, okay, and they'd sort of wander off. Nobody's being prepared for those kinds of things anymore. So when you get bombarded with all this grief, you, in, it end, you end up taking it on and wearing it to a point where you're having all these terrible tragedies. And you're not just taking it from two or three people in no, the playground. No, we've got the social media, the whole that's social media, the Facebook, mm. and you've got the media reporting on the reporting on the reporting on the reporting. Mm. Yeah, yeah mm. predictable that the media would be all over this. It's dreadful. I, I think that it's become far too intrusive and I do think that it ought to be almost banned by radio stations and television stations. All this sort of pranking idea and catching people on the hop and off guard. They, they, don't, they seem to think it's funny but the people that are involved it's terribly hurtful. Yeah. And I hear radio programs all the time that do these gotcha yeah, yeah, type yeah. things. But and I also think those, you know, if you want to do something like that you need to get permission, it shouldn't go live to air. And if, if after they've done that, they get off air and the person says that's okay, then maybe you run with it later. But mm. this idea of a seven second delay, but you've been got. Um, yeah. But it's they are to get permission, even Sure, the law says. I permission. know that, but that's not what they're doing. No, I mean, the, the problem law, is the law, damage is done. The law has to have Absolutely. teeth. Absolutely. Absolutely. But watching these people, and everyone says these young presenters, they're in their thirties, mm. but they said, they just did the spot and then it was up to someone in management and legals and to work it all out. Mm. They're taking yeah. no responsibility you know, for their actions and they're <sighs> encouraged to do some sensational mm. things. That's where it's got to be squashed. Well, I'm a journalist and I have to say that we rules. have always acted by, on a code of ethics. Yeah, yeah. And as a, co a part of our code of ethics is, has always been that when I introduce myself on the telephone yes, or anywhere, yes. I say yes. who I'm... Yeah, the the law and radio is explicit and has Absolutely. been for years. Back in the Wild West days, uh, Basil and Pilko did anything. Yeah, and it was funny. It was and we never pretty heard. innocuous. It was rather innocuous. Well, we never heard any bad consequences. No. But the law changed. And the law now says uh, you have to introduce yourself. Absolutely. And you have to say you're live on air mm -hmm. or I am recording this. Absolutely. Um, it's, so it's, it's a form of dishonesty. It's a form of dishonesty. I yeah. agree. Gotcha journalism. Mm, hate and it's it. not even journalism, hate it's it. Tom Fulry from a, a very silly yeah, kind I of... I distance myself from anybody in that. Yep, I agree with you. And uh, what did you have to say about it? Because we got some um, feedback. Uh, radio pranks. Uh, Canterbury Lace from Adelaide. Hmm. It doesn't matter where the direction comes from, and I don't put the blame on any one person or two people in particular, just believe, as I said before, there are never good ideas, no matter what radio station it is, what state it is in, and what the subject is. I feel very sorry for the announcers, but they should think twice. Uh, Kim Thompson, back into the prank call. I wouldn't, uh, I worked at a call centre for 13 years. Uh, there are protocols in places for things like prank calls, which clearly were not known or followed. Um, it is said in the press that uh, staff are not to put calls through to the St James Hospital. I think it wasn't St James, was yes, it? Edward VII. Yeah. Edward VII, yeah. Um, and yet the poor woman did as if the Queen would ring herself. <laughs> Chose a certain naivety and you've got to agree with that. Okay, now our next question. Animal cruelty. Do you think rodeos or rodeos, depending on your particular pronunciation. Do you think using live animals is entertaining or cruel? And this is what you had to say. No, I think that they are taken very good care of in the response that I've seen them take care of them and actually being, um, you say, it, um, involved in it. No, not really. No, why not? Well, because um, it depends what the animal is. I mean, it can be no good using a dead animal, but live animals, I mean, horses and, uh, you know, monkeys, it's, it's perfectly all right in my book, you know, I don't worry about it at all. Yes, I yeah. think, yeah. Why? Because they, they don't have much freedom and they're always, like, kept in cages and everything and, I don't know, it just doesn't seem fair. And animals, yeah, they shouldn't be, like, taught to do tricks. They should be in the wild. 
not <laughs> running around? Um, in a lot of in a lot of circumstances, yes. Um, it depends sort of what the regulations and like you know safety standards of the animals are, but generally speaking, yeah. Yes, I do. Why do you think that? I think we're at an age now where uh, we're, we're a lot more aware of how amazing animals are, particularly domestic animals, uh, how intelligent they are, although of a different type of intelligence, but um, psychologically we've learned a lot more about animals. Depends which animal there is. they are. Dogs are alright, lions probably not, tigers definitely not. Um, yeah. I think rodeos are, but circuses aren't to an extent, it depends what they do with the animals. Yeah, as long as they're kept in safe um, enclosures and are and looked after yeah. and not treated in a way that is demeaning or um, hurtful to the animal, then yeah, I believe it's fair. Um, well, not necessarily. I think that... I don't think our animal training is in and of itself is cruel, but uh, depending on, I suppose, how the animals are kept when they're not off doing their tricks. Um, I mean, if you sort of got some elephants in your circus and you keep them in a cage 24-7 when they're not uh, in the ring, obviously that's um, not, not too healthy for them and not going to lead to the happiest life. Um, just, uh, yeah, so I guess it depends. Um, it depends how yeah, they're depends, treated, I think. Yeah. If they're treated well, then no. Yeah. But if they're treated by, if they get hit and stuff, then yeah, it yeah. would be cruel. And yeah. <laughs> well, Gillian says yes, of course they're cruel. Gary says no. Um, pretty safe for the animals. Do you, you really think so? Pretty safe for the animals. Most rodeos are cattle musterers, uh, or most rodeos, or whatever you call somebody who drives a, runs a, partakes of a, a. Um, a uh, rodeo, whatever that name is, cowboy I guess. Uh, they work with horses every day and they know how to treat them. They work with and care for animals every day. Well that's not kind of what I see. I don't see that. John, I've recently been to a live circus and the animals looked like they were in pretty good condition. Mm. Yep, I, I guess you'd have to say that they would look after the animals because that's their livelihood. But, mm -hmm. uh, and I, there are a lot of people checking that they do when the Circus recently came in the last school holidays, I think to Benighton Park. There were people there checking the whole mm. time, just waiting for them to slip up. Mm. Yeah. But Christine? I, I'd rather see um, Cirque du Soleil and see people doing clever things. I don't want to see animals doing it. Yeah. I have um, pet dogs and you know I even think about that sometimes and wonder whether we have the right to fence any of our animals in. But the idea of caging animals or hoarding them and herding them for rodeos or circuses, I find it abhorrent. Yeah, you know the Adelaide City Council uh, is coming down with uh, a decision, mm. finally, Good. on whether or not to allow Bullens circuses and the like. into the Adelaide um, Square Mile. Mm. 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 Well, see, I personally don't mind them, and I think it's a lovely way that children can see animals live and doing tricks and that kind of thing. And, and mm. as Caroline said, with all the animal activists out there, they have such strict rules now on how they have to care for them, and they are very well cared for and trained. And then it's not cruel, um, you know, they are looked after. Have you ever seen them pacing in those cages? I mean, lions aren't, aren't yes. supposed to be living in yeah. little cages that are three by four. They yeah. don't have to have lions cruel. in circuses though no. now. They, they no. do more the ponies and dogs and mm. sort of those performing animals. My concern is with the rodeos and the, the cruelty to the steers and mm. I, I know it's come a long way, but there's still, I I've believe, seen. a lot Absolutely. of cruelty. Yeah, I don't know about zoos even, really. I mean, it's a wonderful way to... No. Uh, perhaps uh, protect and uh, uh, encourage future generations of animals. Absolutely. But, but it is then a, you release them back. But it's I a think. hopelessly unnatural mm, environment absolutely. in which they've been put. But then what's worse, Jeremy, when we wipe out rainforests yes. and literally take away the homes and save the orangutans. The habitat. Yeah. And mm. they're, they're not even... Extinct. They're, they're, you know, yeah. Exactly, they're becoming extinct. Mm. Well, why do we do so, that? Why yeah. do we do that? Why, why does any civilised nation allow that to happen. Well, it shouldn't. shouldn't. And why do they... I know they have people out there trying to stop the poaching of elephants and rhinoceros, mm -hmm. but... Oh, moon you know, bears is another example. You know, they're kept yeah. in sun cages, bears, bears. sun bears. Yeah, it's dreadful. Well, Milk while people think there's a dollar in it, it will go on. Absolutely. Always. Mm. Now, our next question is, uh, 
one that I guess we're confronted with every single day of our uh, working and shopping lives, that are, that's the big companies, Coles and Woolworths, there are others obviously, but Coles and Woolworths, it's said, would have between them about 75% of the market, which gives them enormous power. And of course, when you have enormous power, you must have enormous judgment and you must have uh, enormous wisdom because it's huge power that must be handled responsibly. But it is said, of course, that this is not. There's predative pricing, there's um, uh, all kinds of, uh, I suppose you'd call it retail bullying. Now, this is what we heard in Rundle Mall. No, because if other brands haven't stood up, it's their problem and Coles and Woolies have done the right thing. Yep. Why is that? Because uh, the small guy misses out with them, you know, they, 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 they've got too much power, you know, and uh, I don't know how to put it, but I do feel that way, you know, they, they, they're too big, you know. Possibly, but yeah. if they start getting to like a monopoly stage, the ACC will, um, or ACCC will start putting some pressure on them anyway, but maybe between them they do. <laughs> yes. Why is that? Because they've monopolised big business and they've cut out the small business person who would be a lot more personable in, in relating to, to people like you and I. I don't know whether I should answer that because I've got shares in one of them. Yes, I do actually. Yeah, I do. In one of them, yeah. But, uh, hmm? Why do you think that? Uh, well, I mean, it's fairly obvious, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> there's only two of them. Um, I mean, if there were half a dozen of them, things would be a lot better. And the farmers are crying out. The, milk, the milkmen are fire crying out. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I think they do. I really do. Yes, yes definitely. They do. Why do you think that? Um, <laughs> well, I work under the Woolworths brand and it's just stupid. They basically think that they control like most of Adelaide. And it's, it's not letting smaller businesses have a chance in yeah. Adelaide and getting their money up, so we need more small businesses than the big ones. Definitely. I think that's an interesting question because um, it depends on what you mean by power, I suppose. In terms of, I suppose, uh, price fixing and stuff like that, I've heard of a few dodgy practices which they probably shouldn't be getting away with. Um, I don't think they're necessarily powerful in terms of influencing the political uh, process or anything like that, though, so... Yeah, well, um, supermarket powers. Um, Kim says... Yes, simple as that. Sarah Webb says yes, but it's only because of money. Uh, and some people would argue, of course, because of success and being very good at what you do. Uh, and uh, Anna Tolley says no. Now, I've forgotten which end of the line I should be on. <laughs> <laughs> it's been Come one on. of those days. <laughs> Christine. Well, now, all I, I, I think that uh, Coles and Woolworths um, be, uh, competition benefits us, so I'm not sure that it's a bad thing. Um, it keeps prices down. The farmers would argue that they are being bullied, and that's probably true. But we're a global market now. We're not. We're not an Australian market. Mm. We're a global market. Can't have it both so ways. So you can't have it both ways. And um, the opportunity. There's a food shortage globally. So Australian farmers have an opportunity to compete on a global scale. So I don't think it's a bad idea at all. I think that we will always pay for um, um, easy shopping. So those shops that decide, the corner shops that yeah. stay open longer or um, provide access for older people to drive to the gate and get their shopping and not have to walk back with their deliveries, um, you'll pay more for that service. But I think Coles and Woolies will keep us uh, at competitive pricing. Mm. Caroline, you know, uh, you can't blame Coles or Woolies for it, but uh, there are countries that export to Australia and we pay a price in this country that is below the price of the cost of the original manufacturer. So I think that's called dumping. But the, 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 uh, the effect of all of these low prices in supermarkets might be superficially good. Yes and no. But in America they have great concerns that their orange and apple juice, because it's imported from China, is full of arsenic. Hmm. And they're investigating that. Whether or not, I know we import a lot from South America and America itself, how it can be cheaper to import oranges when we've got the Riverland just up the road 
is totally beyond me. Mm. I prefer to use, if I can, the farmer's market. It's difficult to get into the Adelaide market. We have food land. There are, on weekends, Riverland producers who come down and set up stalls. But apart from that, you just shop around. You find what you want and you go one place for your favourite delicatessen outfits and another place for your grocery bags. But people would say, I don't have the time. I'll just go down to Coles or Woolies and it'll all be there and at a reasonable price. Well, I'm a food land shopper, I'll admit that, because I, and I, I like to support South Australian. Yes, excellent. And that's why. Mm. As far as the Coles and Woolies situation goes, I mean, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. And when they get that big, and at the moment, it's a price war. That's, mm. that's fine, but if one wipes the other out, then they will be able to do and price things whatever they want. I'm not so concerned I'm with concerned them getting about into that. gambling in hotels and just buying up hotels and sticking in more and more poking machines. Mm. There doesn't seem to be much regulation on that. Mm. And at the moment, in Coles, if you get your docket, you get buy one wine and get another one free. <laughs> Shortly, they'll be yeah. giving away coupons for the poking machines. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, we'll do something on poking machines next mm. year. Mm. Um, but you know, uh, I think it's uh, Woolworths. Uh, we're up in front of the ACCC, and uh, the ACCC said, well, no, you, you can't. We want to know every time you buy oh, no, a supermarket super or uh, buy a piece of land to build a supermarket. Mm. And I think Woolies just said no. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> no, I ain't going to do that. <laughs> and that will be where they put their next knot of poking machines. Yeah, uh, because basically it means that uh, they will put the smaller people out of business. That will mm. mean less choice mm -hmm. and in the future mm -hmm. higher prices mm -hmm. exactly surely. and the farmers suffer in the whole thing i hope and you that's right. i hope you all have a wonderful christmas happy christmas to you too jeremy Talk and all christmas. our audience christmas. i have a christmas present. oh you're very sweet happy christmas what is it I, open it up okay it's, you'll have a bit of a laugh at least i hope you do <laughs> <laughs> it's not one of those gotcha things that blows up no 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 gotcha but you know when you're walking around your gorgeous garden mm -hmm. This, oh, oh. <laughs> this is a glass that holds a whole bottle of wine, Jeremy, so you can actually honestly say, that, look, that is I've just had one wonderful. glass. <laughs> that, that is an industrial size, my size, uh, wine glass. And I can't ever lose that. No, you can't. Mm. You not only but can't lose it, that but, you is know, it's just one glass. I've it's only whistling. had it's one hard. glass. Mm. Perfect. 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 <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas, Happy Christmas girls. girls. Happy Christmas, Happy girls. <laughs> we'll see them in the new year. This is the Court of Public Opinion. Rundle Mall is conveniently Christmas. With over 700 retailers, 15 arcades and centres, four leading department stores and extended trading hours from Sunday the 9th of December, Rundle Mall has Christmas covered. And for your convenience, we're open on Proclamation Day the 26th of December and New Year's Day too. Visit rundlemall.com for the chance to win $500 cash. Simply enter the code word CHANNEL44. Uniquely Rundle Mall. Scammels, South Australia's specialist estate auctioneers. Visit us at 7 Chapel Street Norwood or at www.scammelauctions.com.au Is trust important to you when building life's biggest investment? Well, look no further than Rossdale Homes. A South Australian family-owned company whose mantra is because trust is a must, has been building quality homes for people like you and me for over 30 years. Rossdale Homes guarantees an absolute fixed price. No hidden extra charges. Choose off the plan or work with their building consultants to design your own. Or visit their website, Rossdale Homes. Because trust is a must. What do you think? I got this at uh, Scammels. This is uh, one of our sponsors. Uh, and I saw it, Freedom of Speech by War Bonds. One of those promotional posters that were around in the 40s. And I looked at it and I thought, well, that, that would be great in the garage. Freedom of Speech. All you had to do was to buy the War Bonds. And we bought the bo War Bonds and we actually won the war, but I think we have diminished freedom of speech rather than increased freedom of speech. But that's the way it goes. And I don't think... Freedom of speech is never going to be able to be bought. Uh, it has to be earned and treasured. But it'll join the, all the other eccentric things in my garage. Now, one thing I did want to say to you, 
uh, do watch the Rundle Mall commercial because there's a, um, a question, um, a code word, and I want you to uh, maybe have the $500 that is on offer. And it's very simple to win it, and I'd love you to have that for Christmas. And thank you to Rundle Mall, and thank you to Scammels, our, our sponsors, and uh, Rossdale Homes, and all the people who support the show, like um, Tailors of Distinction and Hair Artistique. We just couldn't get on without you. Thank you so much, and a very Merry Christmas to you and to all. And in a second, we have our entertainment section. I, I was just talking about our sponsors a second ago, and uh, I didn't mention Garage Mahal. Thank you to you, and a happy Christmas to you as well. I am always interested in the, these kind of on-this-day things. They fascinate me. For example, uh, the world's first motel opened on this day in San Luis Obispo, 1925, in California. How about that? And uh, with regard to show business, which are, we're about to look at, 1975, Jesus Christ Superstar with Trevor White and John English opened at the Festival Theatre in Adelaide. Uh, Big Mama Thornton was born in, <laughs> born in Montgomery, Alabama. Now, why would... Do you know the name? <laughs> Does that stand out? Well, uh, the first person to record Hound Dog, which became a huge hit for obviously Elvis Presley. The song was written in 15 minutes in 1953, and I can hear people saying, well, I knew that. 15 minutes, but it was a very valuable 15 minutes. Songs made a lot of money. Dame Nellie Melba, the first public performance of Dame Nellie Melba. She accompanied herself on the piano in Coming Through the Rye at the opening of the Richmond Town Hall in Melbourne. She was eight years old. Real name, Helen Porter Mitchell. Uh, Johnny Cash says that this was the day that he took his last drug. I don't know. The world's first motor show opened in Paris on the Champs-Élysées. There were nine entries, and that was back in 1894. I love dates, and I also love Betty Samus. I love you too. Are you well? I'm fantastic. How are you? Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas to you too. That's a lovely piece of bling you're wearing. Angie D'Amato Designs. Ah. She's got some fabulous pieces. No, I, th I think you, you do all this extremely well. Thank you. Now, all of the things that you've looked at. Woolworth 69th Carols by Candlelight in Elder Park. Now, are you coming? You know the Rubies are performing. You've never seen me perform, no, have I haven't. you? Oh, no, you did when I was about 24, 25. So. All right. I think it's about time you came and saw the rubies. Right. Yes. We are performing there, along with John Stevens, is the headline act this year. Yeah. And you know that all it's a it's not a gold coin donation this year, it's actually a folded note donation. Indeed. And it goes to the Cora Barclay Centre. Yes. Novita. And of course the Women and Children's Women and Children's Hospital, which always is uh, always um, proud support us off. Wonderful. And Humphrey B. Bear and the Furries. Now this year it actually starts uh, three o'clock in the afternoon so the family can make a day of it. Yes. Yes. And the weather's got to be good. Well I hope so. Fingers crossed the weather's going to be good. And there is y a young guy, Daniel Cook, let me just mention this, that has done wonders in London who is coming. He's a Gawler boy, done well, so he'll be yes. performing as well as Sky. Ingram. A yes. A lot of these Last names don't sort of resonate terribly strongly That's with me, but I guess it's the Generation Y that is <laughs> really the, the <laughs> one that goes is. for this. Well, yes. Well, John Stevens, you would remember from oh, Noiseworks. Oh, of course I do. Yes, yes. Yes. So I'm sure there'll be, um, I'll be able to see uh, a lot of uh, women will we'll flock to the front yes. that night. Yes, listing up and wafting back, and oh, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just want to remind you the Jersey Boys is closing. Oh this Sunday. Well, they must have had a fantastic season they because have. the show is really good. Probably the best I've ever seen. I loved it too. Yeah. I think I might try and sneak one more in there before I go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, so if you haven't seen the Jersey Boys, please get to see that. It, it uh, shuts on Sunday. Now, mm -hmm. the big one is Les Mis opens on Boxing Day. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, this stars Hugh Jackman, Russell Crowe, and of course, Anne Hathaway. It's been getting rave reviews. Now, do you know Tom Hooper, the director? No. 
Okay, well, he uh, directed the King's Speech. Oh. And he has actually made the actors sing live, not pre-recorded in mind, which is quite yeah. interesting. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, I think it would probably be harder to mime than it would be to actually get up there and sing the song, given that you knew all the words and all the rest of it. But uh, I, I think people would accept the reality of a live performance mm. on film. Well, people have been apparently 10 minutes into the movie, uh, Hugh, Jackman, Hugh, Hugh Jackman sorry, mm. tears up his passport and throws it out in the wind and the floor starts then. But he wasn't even a boat person. <laughs> That's right. Apparently there's about 14, 15 times where the audience claps through the movie. So it's quite, there, there are some quite special moments. I'm actually going to go and see it next week. So hopefully I'll be able to give you a first hand review on what I think of it. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I would say it's dark. Uh, it's certainly moving. It is. Uh, but you know, you, you sort of get the feeling that you're, you're, you're going to have a dose of the glums rather than uh, anything else. But apparently it's quite uplifting. Well, I should hope it's uplifting. Yes. Anyway, just like Christmas is uplifting. Indeed. Human Nature are performing at the uh, Entertainment Centre with uh, the ASO. Now these boys are huge in Las Vegas. They haven't been here for two years. Yes. They've been there uh, playing at uh, the Imperial Palace and they've been re-signed there for another couple of years. So well done, our boys. Yeah, well, we can make it. And time and time and time again, we demonstrate that. But probably it doesn't get any easier with each success story. It probably gets a bit harder. Everyone's competing for that Las Vegas huge dollar. But uh, good for them. They've done extremely well. And I saw them on a morning show the other day, and they are still slick as. So looking forward to that. Yep. Now, I've got a couple of Christmas presents for you. Oh, really? And Abba, yes. Now... What are you doing on New Year's Eve? Or what are you doing at the end of January? I'm sort of trying to work out whether I should give you the backstage pass for Big Day Out or Amber, or whether to give you the tickets to The Illusions. <laughs> Which Aren't one would better sweet. be suited? Well, I don't think the Big Day is kind of my thing. So I'm no Big Day Out for you. For okay, so day. we'll leave this. I haven't had a Big Day Out for quite <laughs> some time, and it would probably kill me, and you wouldn't want that right. in your conscience. We'll leave this <laughs> backstage pass for Amber to hear her Bada Bing Bada Bing music, and here's the illusionists for you well, to go and I've see. Well, I've heard that is and, uh, absolutely wonderful. It will be a great show, so yep. I'm hoping. Merry Christmas, and thank you for thank everything. You, I'll see you next year. Have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas and New Year. You too. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact date that we get back on the air, yep. but thank you for what you've done for us this year. And thank you for all that you've done for me too. Bless your heart. Bless yours too. Betty, and we'll be right there with you in a second. Almost out of time. I have no idea where the time goes, but it certainly does. Uh, a couple of things that you put under the heading of feedback, I guess. Anne says, don't slouch. <laughs> Stand up straight. You know, I have noticed that. See, I should sit like that, and I should walk like that, but I, I catch myself doing this. So you're perfectly right. I've just got to remember. Stand up straight. Put the shoulders back. What was the song? Walk uh, Walk tall, walk straight, look the world right in the eye. That's what my mother told me when I was about knee high. So I remember that. Walk tall. I agree with that. And John says, what do you have against Julia Gillard? <sighs> well, I think Australia <sighs> could be, should be, in a much better place. And we're not. And when a potential prime minister says something as important as my policy will be there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead. And then she reverses it simply because she has to do the deal because that's the price the Greens want to keep her in office. Uh, and I don't think we should be lied to. I think even if it is impossible for somebody to keep his or her election promise, the honourable thing to do is what that Greek government did. They simply said, no, nope, um, we can't do this. I can't get support to form a government unless I go back on my word and I will not go back on my word. Now that's all I've got against Julia Gillard. I just think that uh, to make a public promise and a carbon tax in Australia makes no sense at all because we will make no impact on glo global pollution. And just one other quick thing before we go to Pet of the Week. You know how on the news they show you these smokestacks spewing all this stuff, which um, 
it, it looks like um, something menacing. It's steam. It's water. It is not pollution. Carbon dioxide is an invisible, odourless gas. You can't see it. So what they show us, to try and make their point visually, is steam coming out of a chimney. And it, it is completely safe. But they don't want to say that. This is the great pollution. And just keep in mind, cheap energy was our biggest benefit going back through many, many generations. Cheap coal. Now, uh, pet of the week. Here we go. Just trying to find the picture. Uh, true to say I'm not the most technical person. Here we go. Is it Frodo? Here he is. Now, the pet of the week, and we're looking for a home, a Christmas home for Frodo. Frodo. <laughs> it's a very strange name, isn't it? Frodo. Um, I am a very active but loving dog who is full of energy and wants lots of exercise. If you live uh, an active lifestyle and want to be part of, uh, uh, have Frodo being a part of your lifestyle, you obviously would be a very good match. Now, that's a handsome dog, isn't it? Possibly yellow eyes and tan, maybe a sheepdog or something like that. Um, now, you can come and see uh, Frodo at the Animal Welfare League, 1 to 19 McCormack Road at Wingfield. And I think the dog comes with all of those things that you'd expect. Uh, I'm a four year old male Australian Kelpie. Yep. I'm a medium sized dog and have red and white coat you know, fully vaccinated and uh, all the things that you would expect. I'm not sure, I can't see a price, but uh, obviously a steal for a wonderful, loyal, loving dog, Frodo. And if you could make his Christmas, it would be lovely and I'm sure he would make yours. It's a home theatre. It's an office. It's a salon. It's a bar. It's a garage? Garage Mahal can transform your shed, carport, garage or undercroft into your favourite room in the house. You'll be surprised with what we can do with that disorganised messy space. Regardless of your reasons, your lifestyle or hobby, we can create whatever you can imagine. So call Garage Mahal today on 1300 839 353. Great house. Thank you. Rossdale built it for us. We love it. I'll show you through. We wanted a house with a barley feel, so we worked with our building consultant and designers to develop a plan we liked. They were so flexible and cooperative. When it was all designed, we got an absolute fixed price and they stuck to it. No extra charges and their people were fantastic to work with. We're actually thinking of building a new home. You should go and see all their displays and talk to them about your ideas. It's the best thing we've ever done. Rossdale Homes, because trust is a must. I've been waiting months to get into this chair, be seen in this chair. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm fascinated with its history and all. Uh, it's the last show of the year, and uh, as you know, in television and radio, you can't do very much without sponsorship. And I'd just like to take this moment to thank our sponsors, Rossdale Homes. And by the way, with Rossdale, um, they've just built, I think there's one house of the four or five that they're constructing on Portrush Road at Glenunga. And I'll let you know more about that next year. But that's going to be a major display centre for them. And, and they're great people. And discerning sponsors. Garage Mahal, I thank you and wish you a happy Christmas. And uh, the Rundle Mall people, that's every store and every person who goes and shops there. Uh, you are contributing to the success of this program. And uh, Scammels, thank you for being there. And producing or selling much of the stuff that you see in my eccentric garage. And my dear friends at Hair Artistique and Tailors of Distinction, thank you and we wish you well for Christmas. Now, can I bring in my son? Uh, come in here, Christopher. 
Now, you mightn't have seen Christopher. Christopher's my youngest boy. I've got them going up to 40, haven't I? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I don't know what I was possibly thinking. But um, uh, welcome to the garage and the show. And I, I, I wanted to introduce you now because I'd like you to do some bits on the show next year. Okay, that'd be great. So I introduced you a few moments ago as a special guest. Yeah. Is this the first time you've ever been a special guest? Uh, no. Oh, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, I'm proud of you, and uh, we'll look forward to you doing some bits and pieces for the Court of Public Opinion next year. Okay, that'll be great. What do you want for Christmas? Uh, just a couple of CDs and okay. DVDs. All right. I'll, I'll let you go now, because uh, the list will get longer while I sit here asking silly questions. Have a great Christmas on behalf of all our sponsors, our crew, uh, and all the people who have been on the show over the last uh, eight weeks. Have a great Christmas, a safe new year. We we'll look forward to seeing I'm not exactly sure when it's going to be back. I think possibly it's the, the early middle part of January. Anyway, I look forward to that. Thank you for watching. Believe in yourself. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Goodbye for now. Rundle Mall is conveniently Christmas. With over 700 retailers, 15 arcades and centres, four leading department stores and extended trading hours from Sunday the 9th of December, Rundle Mall has Christmas covered. And for your convenience, we're open on Proclamation Day the 26th of December and New Year's Day too. Visit rundlemall.com for the chance to win $500 cash. Simply enter the code word CHANNEL44. Uniquely Rundle Mall.